An der neuen Kirche, die Schäsch gibt es Kamera von der BBC, Tourist gibt es die Krühe von der Warte Polestar. Weil die Borten haben solch, und es wird freihaltig, die haben solch ein Volk, die an der Tür nicht halten. Ob es war jet macht, und es war kein Mal hechen, verkostet eine Halbe Sawalt, wo hundert in Skeden, und es nicht hechen. Leviert Bord, das war Paraffin, Burn, Storis B, Agus Nes Kutrimiche Bülach, Luch Oprach, Nen Hain Solis, Gangjulan, Gotschiv, Hörat Korum, Prospigechud, Er Doi Behe, Hanisch, Ede Gola B. Be Aim Sohorije, Vasho, An den Yachtrin, Nen Hain Solis, Agus Kujarav, Jede Glien. Er schon da hier die Blione, Wann et Hain Solis, Eden Kamala Doll, Le Luch Oprach, Trüd et Gachfer, a kamal na solis lasig je a lasig eintje. Schach las in hachgon, gach lag in a vlione. At de neue kiert jeekes schesget, agus neue kiert jeekes ochget, gut bord te hen solis a gine tue rope, nen hen solis a gianu fein oprechal. Er skaas na koskis in a van leib a wie a kamal loch koprech, et kor agus nechet te solis. Bei Gas war sie klachtig an den Hüsten Mühr und schon eine solche Lassung. Alles kann ich kochen, kann ich die solche Aarchung, wo wir ruhig auf Gas als ich hier gewesen bin. Das ist ein Chor, kann ich lesen, dass die Neukirche ist auch gut. Bei der solche Elanfahrer und Jess sind die solche mit jeder Genalabe, die Krüge kann abbrechen. Alles an der Nähe zu hoch, kann ich ja nur fein abbrechen. Das ist ein Grafem, der Tent und Loch Koprach, der mehr an Jü erreicht, und es ist ein gutes Grafem, aber es ist ein Koni, der Loch Thürich. Und Jü hat daher ein bisschen Wort, dass der Freihalt in den Solis, und schon auf die Karte in Januar in den Solis wurde, und es ist ein Solis weg, und es ist ein Kamala Doll. Und es hat zwei Jü schon, dass die Gäule an einem Warte und Kone geschehen, als ein Programm, ein Polestar. Schau mal hier, die Northern Lights. It is this man's job to take his ship where other ships ought not to go. Steady. Steady, sir. Pole Star is on her way to relieve the most remote lighthouse in the British Isles. Hello, Sulskiri, Sulskiri, Sulskiri. Pole Star calling. Pole Star calling, Sulskiri. Well, there is a little bit of a problem. Pole Star. Sulskiri is flying. Good morning, Mr. Kirkman. Receiving you fine, and conditions here are pretty grim just now. The wind is southwest by west, force nine, gusts to ten at times, showers, and there's no landing. Now, did you get that, please? Over. Hello, Sulska. Yes, I got that loud and clear. Uh, you see, the wind is southwest by west, nine, uh, no landing at the moment. There is no landing. No possibility of relieving the lighthouse keepers on Sul Skerry, that black and lonely lump of rock and guana 30 miles west of Auckland. And so, the Pole Star, one of the four ships used to service the 300 lights and beacons round Scotland and the Isle of Man, will take shelter and wait for a better day. Sul Skerry was made by the birds, for the birds. The soil they have created holds hazards even on the short journey to empty the crude lavatory pen. Two of the three lightkeepers have been on the rock for six weeks. One will go home tomorrow, if the Pole Star calls. Tomorrow is a better day. The flag says, landing possible.
Hey, boys, what are we together now? The Pole Star's second mate is in charge of the working boat, the tough launch which alone can nose into the treacherous gully which is the landing place. Fresh food for the men who are by now probably on potatoes, dried milk and tinned foods. But there's plenty of these on the rock. The lighthouse, like Sulskerry, is stocked with water for a year and food for 14 weeks. For the principle of relief is that if the Pole Star tries for a landing on five successive days and fails, the relief is abandoned for three more weeks. After all, the Pole Star has other lighthouses to service to ensure that, if possible, the lightkeeper's rotor is maintained of six weeks on and three ashore. This relief keeper is back from his three weeks rest. Let go now, boys. Go ahead, Willie. Hard and experienced sailors man the working boat. They know every treacherous finger of rock at the landing places. The man who works the engine is the man who keeps it serviced. The boat reconnoitres, and the mate decides that a landing in the gully is possible. So he moves far out to drop a holding anchor at the end of a stout rope. The rope and the anchor are vital for him. They're his means of holding the boat from being dashed against the rocks and hauling her clear should his engine fail. Sailor and the relief keeper are first ashore to give the rockmen a hand hauling up the supplies. On some lighthouses, like the pillar ones that stand straight out of the sea, men may be weakened by lack of exercise, and extra help is essential. There's no time for hello or how are you. 
That boat must be got out of the gully in the quickest possible time in case of a sudden change of wind or a strengthening of the swell. As soon as the boat goes, the tackle is made secure. Any accident to it could make the next landing extremely tricky. And then the stores have to be got up to the lighthouse. Today, Sue Scarry has a petrol engine to haul the loaded bogey to the top. In other days, the supplies had to be taken on men's backs. Only now is there time for conversation. A spasmodic, jerky conversation which is characteristic of the rock men. But then there's never much time, for the perpetual watch has to be resumed. Bread is specially made to last three weeks. But if relief doesn't come, all lighthouse keepers can bake. Not too bad, Bob, considering, no. you know. I didn't think we'd see you there at all, man. No. No, no. See you by this morning coming out, everything, top past seven. All right, enough, uh, I didn't... If you're in danger of being isolated for six weeks or more, you have to be able to cope with any emergency. Against the worst, rock lighthouses are supplied with coffin board. Most major lighthouses have fog horns and radio navigational aids. But in addition to attending to these, the three keepers on Sewell Scarry keep details of temperature, atmospheric pressure and rainfall to send in to the meteorological office at Wick, where they will be computed and fed back as part of the weather forecast. So scary calling. Are you receiving me, please? Over. So scary, so scary, Wick Matt. Uh, hello there, you. And I'm not receiving you too well. There's a lot of background uh, interference, over. Hello, hello, Wick Matt. Good afternoon, Ian. I'm receiving you loud and clear. You say you're not getting me too well, but uh, I'll just carry on with the 1500 observation and hope that you pick me up not too badly. And it's 010, commencing 81113. And double eight seven two zero. Did you get that okay, Ian? Over. So scary, so scary, wink, mate. Uh, yes, uh, hello there, Angus. Um, I got that okay. Got some rain and rain and snow, uh, which is coming up from the south. It may well affect you as rain this afternoon um, before we go into the west of this, uh, tonight. So I think that's all in just now, Angus, and we'll hear you at 20 to 6. Over. 
Hello, hello, Wink Met. Yes, Ian, got you loud and clear again. And you got the message okay? That's fine. Housekeeping is meticulous in the round living room two stairs up. Normally, the principal light keeper is excused from cooking. Shifts are four hours on and eight off. For the men off, there's little to do. Two-handed card games are limited. Nowadays, television helps. That's it, no. Yes, that's some podcast, Angus. No great, Bob. That's a good job, just the same with the winds away around into the west, boy. Aye, if it hung around here, would you? And there are endless cups of tea. Tea made from the left-hand kettle. The one with the string is salt or rainwater for washing and washing up. Despite the potential dangers on a rock station like Sulskerry, serious accidents are few and far between. I have seen only one tragedy, and uh, that was when I was the principal keeper on Sulskerry. We lost the, one of the assistants. He uh, went for a, a walk one afternoon, and uh, he failed to come back which we, uh, we didn't notice this until it was time for tea at night time. We thought that he had fallen asleep. It was a very warm day and he possibly had been sunbathing. When uh, we missed him at tea time, we went out and searched for him. We didn't find him and uh, we searched all that evening. It was eight days later uh, before we found the body in the Duncan's Rock Gully, and we presume that he had fallen into the one part of the gully, and the body was only dislodged when the swell started to get up in the sea. There are in all 72 manned lighthouses around the Scottish coast. They, and all the buoys and beacons, except those in the river estuaries of the Forth, Tay and Clyde, are under the management of the Commissioners of Northern Lighthouses, made up of the two law officers, the Sheriff's Principal and local authority representatives. Their money comes from a levy of one and fivepence per tonne from every ship calling to British port. Their policy is one of constant modernization. Here on the extreme tip of the most distant Orkney Island, North Ronaldsea, stands one of the very modern lighthouses. The new North Ronaldsea Lighthouse replaces the old peat-burning one, which, because of an unfortunate sighting, had a habit of luring ships onto this coast rather than warning them off. The new lighthouse is equipped with a foghorn and a radio direction beacon, which constantly pumps out the letters NR in Morse for ships to pick up as a cross-bearing on other beacons in their area. But modern as North Ronaldsea is, its lamp is still paraffin lit, and there is only one way to get the fuel to the top. Most lighthouses still work on the vaporized paraffin principle. There are several reasons for this. There's less danger of failure for one thing. For another, the penetration of the magnified paraffin light is hard to beat. This massive lens magnifies the mantle light to many thousands of candle power. But it works on a very elementary clockwork principle of weights and chains. It revolves at an incredibly accurate rate, as it must do to give North Ronaldsea light its flashing frequency of one second flash every 10 seconds.
Once the keeper is in the light room for his four-hour shift, he mustn't leave it. He mustn't read. He mustn't listen to the radio. In the event of the radio direction beacon failing, he can summon assistance by a series of bells. That lens must never stop. And to keep it going, the weight has to be wound up to the top every half hour. If it's ever allowed to reach and rest on the floor, the lens will stop revolving and the keeper is liable to instant dismissal. This ratchet is a safety device. If the weight approaches the floor, the ratchet goes silent. And if that silence doesn't waken a dozing watchman, the next safety device will. The light rarely goes out. Once, when there was a mechanical failure, the keepers kept the lens revolving by hand for 17 long winter nights. Such dedication comes not only from long training, but also, as in the case of Dan Mitchell of North Ronaldsey, from generations of service. I am the fifth generation of my uh, family in the lighthouse service. My great-great-grandfather was at the building of the Bell Rock Lighthouse and uh, got the opportunity of joining the service after it was completed. I have been 26 years on the lighthouse, in the lighthouses. Uh, I joined when I was 17, and uh, during this time, I have been to about two-thirds of my time on rock and island stations. This, of course, is an island station, and uh, we have our families with us on it. The station is on the most isolated of the Orkney Islands. And although we are a, a community within ourselves at the station, the, we are also part of the island community. There is a school on it with 17 children attending it. And uh, to this school go our children from the lighthouse. For the shore station wives, family life is easy compared with that of the rock families. Linda was only two years old when Dan was promoted to principal and his station was so scary, which is a rock station, meaning that he was two months away and one month at home, which we were there four years, so she only really saw him four months out of every year. What I found about it, that she relied very heavily on me, and although she had great fun when Daddy was at home, she still had to come to me for every decision. And although we've been here three years now, it's still quite the same. Although Daddy says she can do something, she must always come and get Mummy's permission first. And I think that's one of the snags of the rock stations as far as uh, the families are concerned, especially with boys whom I think really need their fathers at home. Of course, some boys would be wild no matter if their fathers were at home all the time, but it's rather distressing for some mothers to have to put up with uh, telling the boys always what to do and sometimes some resort to it. Wait till your daddy comes home and he'll sort you out, which isn't really nice considering they're not home for very long and making them out to be ogres. Another snag with uh, being at... Uh, in the lighthouse service in the whole, as the children have got to change schools every time we get a shift. Starboard a little. Starboard a little, sir. To keep the sea routes safe for shipping is the Pole Star's job. 
That can include anything from dealing with dangerous flotsam to servicing 188 beacons and buoys around the coast. Today, a fault has been reported in the 70-ton Barrel of Butter buoy, which flashes day and night off the jagged shore of Orkney. The buoy gets its name from the treacherous little island against which it warns shipping. Starboard a little again. again sir. An island which a seal hunter once rented from its overlord for one barrel of butter a year. should be six months before this particular boy needs attention again. Back at base, spare lamps are on permanent test. Ready, waiting, if word comes that somewhere a light has failed. And now, en route for the Flannan Isles, 20 miles west of Lewis, right out in the Atlantic.
here, on December the 15th, 1900, developed the great lighthouse mystery of all time. A passing ship reported that there was no light on planet. The lighthouse tender Hesperus was sent out to investigate. We landed and made fast the boat and climbed the track in single file, each wishing he were safe afloat on any sea, however far, so be it far from Flannan Isle. Yet all too soon we reached the door that gaped for us ajar. The scene as it was when the rescue crew arrived, one set of oilskins and Wellington boots in the entrance hall. The bunks neatly made. The clock stopped. A table from which somebody had got up in a hurry. Oil lamps trimmed. We seemed to stand for an endless while, though still no word was said. Three men alive on Flannan Isle who thought of three men dead. The men on Flannan Isle, 68 years later, take a pragmatic view of the mystery as they sit round that same table. Donald McLeod is the occasional assistant on Flannan Isle. I think what could have happened was that uh, one of the two men outside could have gone berserk and uh, the, the other fellow called for assistance, which sort of accounts for the man inside to just run out and leave as he was in his shirt sleeves. And in, in their struggle with this man, the cliff, being quite close to the back gate, he could probably uh, drag them over or he would have fallen over the cliff. Sandy Dishon, lately principal keeper. I think what really happened was that, owing to stormy weather, they had gone out to save some equipment that was in danger or maybe something had been damaged. However, the third person left very hastily and uh, he uh, probably joined the others. But where they were is unknown. But in the case of it being uh, storm damage and that well, where the sea was coming up, it's quite possible they were all washed away. And that's as near as one can ever get to a solution of the mystery of Flannan Isles. Here's where it almost certainly happened. In all probability, two keepers went to the west landing here to secure a crane, something like this. Here where 200-foot waves and the power of the Atlantic winds can bend strong railings. It may be that one man got into trouble and his colleague ran to get help from the third, who was sitting shirt-sleeved in the living room. A cardinal rule was broken. The lighthouse was left unmanned. And a bigger wave than the others did the rest. In high summer, the Flannans are a haven of peace. Here, to the friendliness of the lighthouse, the weary ring dove comes for sanctuary. The lighthouse, which stands sentinel over aged dwellings, one of them referred to as the temple, whose ancient origin no one knows. Legend has it that this was once a Druid settlement, and the old name for the Flannans was Insulae Sacrae, the Sacred Isles. As rock stations go, the Flannans are reasonably comfortable. Here a man can at least stretch his legs. But what makes a man want to come to spend six long weeks 
in this kind of isolation. I was at sea for 11 years before joining the lighthouse service. I was single then, of course. First trip after I got married lasted about seven months, so I thought in the lines of getting a job ashore, the lighthouse service seemed to be a natural choice. It's run the much same lines as a ship, watch keeping and so forth. You might think my choice of a job wasn't much different, but I find it quite a different. Seven months away from home at the time is a long time for a married man. And six weeks here is, it suits me fine. Three weeks ashore. And time passes fairly quickly, especially in the summertime. I find my fishing, a few creels off the rocks, keeps you busy, time passes. You know. This is fishing the hard way, but the occasional fresh lobster is a welcome change from lighthouse diet. In the quiet of Oban Bay is based the Pole Star sister ship, the Fingal. But from here, she services Skerivor, the pillar lighthouse that stands 30 miles west of the Mull of Kintar. Today is watering day. The relief begins at first light because the thousand gallons of water and the 1200 gallons of oil can only be landed while the spring tide is favorable. That is for a mere five or six hours. They say that Skerivor is the most beautiful lighthouse in the world, but it's in a terrible place. And you can imagine how ugly it would be on a dark night with high tide. The reef itself extends to seven miles and the lighthouse was built by Alan Stevenson, the uncle of Robert Louis Stevenson. Fifty years up to the time of it being built, there are records of 31 wrecks on the reef. But of course, these are only wrecks that they have records of. If possible, the Skerivor water supply will be topped up again in the autumn, if tide and weather allow. But this, any sailor will admit, is one of the hardest chores of the year.
Right. It can be a very dangerous place to carry war, and especially as you have to go in among these jagged rocks that you see there. I remember uh, one morning going in, and as we were approaching the landing, this heavy sea came in and swept the rock swept the grating where the men were standing and uh, only the top of the derrick was visible. When the sea subsided, there was only one keeper on the grating and he was hanging on to the derrick. But when the grating cleared, fortunately, the other keeper was underneath it, the second keeper, he was underneath it, hanging on to one of the legs. And the third keeper was hanging over the grating having had his wrist caught in a cleat on the grating. So I've never seen three such lucky men in my life. I thought we'd never see them again. Water is poured into a reservoir carved out of the rocks and is pumped up into the storage tank in the pillar itself. You can't just slip out with a pitcher to the reservoir when 100-foot waves are lashing the reef. And in any case, your front door is 25 feet up. These days of giant helicopters, it would be a formidable task to build a 138 feet of pillar lighthouse on a frequently submerged Atlantic reef. A pillar to withstand waves that crash with a weight of 6,000 pounds to the square foot. 130 years ago, it was an incredible achievement. A base of Tyree granite, each block cut and numbered 20 miles away. And today you can still see the rusting stanchions of Alan Stevenson's working platforms. Here, for the first time, a new system of oil landing is being tried out. Till now, each gallon had to be manhandled in barrels. A huge tank is fitted into the working boat. And the oil is pumped into the lighthouse storage tanks. A system that may one day be applied also to water when it has been proved in rough weather. There are, as it were, 11 flats in Skerribor. From the entrance flat, 30 feet above sea level, to the light room at the top. Living quarters are superbly modern, and the furniture is tailored into the funnel of building. 
The place was refurbished after it had been seriously damaged by fire in 1958. Fortunately, the fire occurred the night before the relief was due. The keepers had no time to send out a distress message. They just had to make for the rock with the clothes they stood in and uh, they crouched there all night. I don't know what would have happened had the relief not been due or had the weather broken in the interval. But uh, when the ship arrived on the relief day, it was still smouldering, of course. But there's a funny story connected to this. A small guillemot came out of the water and climbed up on the rock where the men were crouching and sat with them all night. Some say this was an old lightkeeper come back to keep them company. There will be lighthouse legends as long as men man the lights. But why, in the late 20th century, can automation not take over? The man concerned is Alistair Robertson, general manager of the Northern Lighthouse Board. Automation, of course, is very important, and we are steadily increasing the number of automatic and, and semi-automatic lights. This is no very great problem uh, where you're dealing with the light only, uh, particularly if you have mains power, and, and we have got mains power at most of the stations now. But to automate a fog signal is, is very much more difficult. As a matter of fact, Trinity House have been doing a lot of work on this, and we have uh, an experimental fog detector in operation now. I'm, I'm hopeful this will be fully working by about this time next year. Uh, and if this is the case, uh, we shall then be able to control our fog signals entirely automatically. And this will be a very major breakthrough. There is another aspect of automation, uh, and that is to make the offshore lighthouses automatic. This, of course, is a very difficult thing to do indeed, because once the light keepers come away from these rock lights, lighthouses, uh, you can't get back onto the rock except by air. You can't get back by sea, um, not as a regular routine, because the sea conditions just don't allow you to do so. You have to do it, therefore, by air, and this means helicopters. And we have had a great deal of help and cooperation recently from the RAF over this. And I am reasonably hopeful that we may be able to make new Hartuch automatic within the foreseeable future. Until automation comes, the principal keeper and Sewell Skerry or Clannan Isle or any other rock lighthouse will go down to the water's edge to judge whether he can give the relief ship the all clear or must say each day for five days there is no landing, thus isolating himself and his two companions for another three weeks. On his decision rests the lives of men. And till automation comes, men on the Pole Star and her sister ships will take every reasonable chance to service the keepers of the Northern Lights.